Hello, everyone, and welcome. Good morning from where I am, which is the west coast of Canada. But of course, we have panelists, we have the audience members from all over the world. So good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are, especially if you're joining from different time zones. Uh, I am Georgia Bose. I'm technology correspondent at CNBC Business News, and I am thrilled and honored to be participating and moderating this incredibly important discussion. Uh, today's workshop is, of course, organized by the World Economic Forum's Generation AI Project, which examines children and artificial intelligence. We will hear more about the project after the panel discussion, uh, so do stay tuned for that. Uh, now, before we wanted to kick off, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what I've been spending a lot of my year doing, and professionally, that is, it's been a lot of talking about next generation technologies like AI, machine learning, robotics, and more on TV. Without a doubt, one of the biggest stories of this year that has kept myself and many of my colleagues busy is TikTok. At the core of that story, the saga is about an AI algorithm with an incredibly popular app in the hands of our youth. Um, it has led to geopolitical tensions, debates over national security, and the ability of artificial intelligence to empower and potentially endanger. So it could not be more timely to have this discussion. I, for one, am glad uh, that it's not happening on TV where we have only a few minutes to tackle these really interesting and often difficult uh, subjects, but that we have 40 minutes and then some breakout sessions to talk through all of this. And we will not be talking about TikTok, but we will be talking about some of those underlying issues. We'll examine the topics of children, youth, and AI through the Sustainable Development Goals. We will discuss children's rights in a digital age, reducing the digital divide, leveraging artificial intelligence to improve education, and strategies to partner with and empower youth. We have an incredibly esteemed, diverse group to discuss all of this with. And with that, let me introduce uh, our speakers. We have Dr. Fayez King, he is a deputy executive director at UNICEF. We also have Dr. Virginia Dingham is a professor uh, of ethical and social artificial intelligence at UMIA University in Sweden. You will notice her backdrop, which is beautiful, is actually the Northern Lights. Uh, Dr. Ronald Dahl. Ron is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley and director of the Institute of Human Development. So we're normally neighbors because I'm based in San Francisco. Dr. David Monoye Senge is, we hope, that will join us throughout the session. Uh, he is Minister of Basic and Senior Secondary Education in Sierra Leone. We also have Mr. Alexander Vidyakin is the first Deputy Chairman of the Executive Board at Spurbank. And Ms. Sandrine Rutia Sri Amahoro is a member of the World Economic Forum's inaugural AI Youth Council and student at Gasora Girls Academy in Rwanda. And I mean, what better than have someone who can actually live these issues and speak to them. So I'm, I'm thrilled that she could join us. We will also be hearing later on from Ms. Henrietta Four, Executive Director at UNICEF, who will join us for closing remarks at the end of the session. So welcome to everyone. I don't know if everyone can see you, but you can give a little wave. I'm switching to my gallery mode. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> it is great that you could be with us in your respective uh, time zones. So let's let's just jump right in because I am very excited for this session and I think we've got some great questions some great issues. And um, as I said before, engagement, we love engagement. So uh, feel free to jump in if you hear something that you like. Um, let's start with Mr. Fias King. Fias, uh, what are the most pervasive, some of the most difficult challenges and risks that youth globally face in terms of technology and in particular artificial intelligence today. Great, uh, thank you Deirdre. Uh, the very pervasiveness of artificial intelligence is why we're here today. Children and young people will have the greatest exposure to AI over the course of their life. AI will be integrated into information they receive, the opportunities they afforded and the services that they enjoy. Because of this, there are major concerns around privacy, freedom, access to knowledge, and access to services and opportunities. We're still at the infancy, the beginning stages to see the full impact of AI and machine learning on a child's life. And this can only be imagined. 
regardless, it's our responsibility as advocates for child's rights to ensure that AI is conceived of and designed, implemented and monitored with children and particularly the most vulnerable in mind. The ability to gather huge amounts of data comes with issues of privacy, of freedom, and these can be addressed through awareness of risks, policies that safeguard children because there'll be those inevitable breaches, especially when we are gathering data. Data needs to be collected and be proportional to the need. When the challenge is automated, discrimination and exclusion bias creeps in. The more we know, the better. The high resolution population data has great potential for improving, especially humanitarian operations, but understanding and addressing these biases of machines needs human intervention. For example, UNICEF is using AI technology to tackle the threat of disease outbreaks, not just COVID, but Ebola, Zika, Dengue, and, other, and others. In recent years, the availability of data on human behavior combined with environmental measures have led to great advances in our ability to model and predict epidemics. In support of this, we work with Telefonica through data philanthropy has shared and processed mobility data with us to provide insights and movements in, ep in epidemics and epidemiology. But the best is, is that the data sets need to be looked at with care. UNICEF is developing a methodology to quantify bias and our scientists are building models around this that we are able to combine data from different sources and produce a more accurate view. Finally, every day, the digital divide grows. As AI systems expand, inequalities rise with regards as to who has access to these technologies and the, ultimately, the opportunities to access these affords. UNICEF has partnered with a multiple number of organizations to bring accessibility to 3.6 billion children around the world. Efforts to use AI whilst mitigating against the risks must always be taken into consideration. So in this, we invite the private sector, we invite everybody around us to share knowledge and let's co-create so that we address these issues around children. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Faiz, and what a great way to lay out uh, some of the opportunities, but also the challenges and certainly the div digital divide is something that's never been so important, especially amid a global pandemic. Um, let's go to Sandrine next, because I would love to know how you feel, how today's youth feel about AI technology. And as a youth leader, what excites you about AI's positive impact, but also if you can speak to perhaps some of the things that might worry you, Sandrine. Yeah, thank you. So when, um, when it comes to the youth today, I think the problem that they most struggle with is involvement, is involvement in AI technology. I mean, with 51% of the global population being on social media, most of the time you hear them talk about the dangers and the risks of AI technology instead of the positive impact. And that, and that for one, you tend to show AI in a negative light and uh, they tend to see AI as the displacement of jobs instead as an advantage that could help us enhance human, enhance, enhance human limitations and create machines that could, could assess that. But for me, what excites me when, when it comes to AI technologies, its ability to explore new horizons that we otherwise thought were impossible. I mean, in these days, you see the new technologies evolve, say, for example, Alexa, autonomous cars, you know. And to be honest, all those things I would see in cinema, but now seeing them being put into play in real life systems is just triggering and exciting for me. So that now AI being able to embrace and go beyond our imagination and help us solve humanity's pressing problems at the moment triggers and excites me to into knowing what AI is all about and pursuing the career. Thank you. That's fascinating, Sandrine, especially the notion that perhaps today's youth are more worried about it than they are excited about it. So your perspective is, is really interesting. I wonder too, if I could just follow up with that, what are the ways that you and others interact with AI? You mentioned Alexa, is it through social media platforms? What are some of the ways that you 
like to interact with AI and perhaps if there's any that you don't like interacting. I know some people get worried about giving all of their information to Amazon and therefore uh, Amazon's assistant, Alexa. Yeah, <laughs> well, my interaction with AI came when I was interested in how a machine is able to understand and you know predict whatever I was going to say. say um, Siri and Alexa is what triggered me the most, being able to have an assistant that performs every simple task that I could do, but you know, provides that assistance like it's a person and a human that that really brought that really brought the AI technology to life for me. And also when it comes to social media platforms and even in education. And even in education, when uh, when they when they use technology to be able to measure the concentration of children and all these in and it being applied in all these fields, I think AI has done a lot, of, a lot for us. Um, Great, and I hope we didn't just trigger everyone's uh, series or Alexa's or Google Assistant's by talking here. <laughs> Maybe I just did. Um, Zandrine, thank you for that overview. Dr. Ron, Ron Dahl, uh, I would like to ask you, as a de developmental scientist and the academic side of things, how does technology affect children and youth? We heard from Fayez about some of the bias that can become inherent. We heard from Sandrine, some of the positive ways that it's viewed by the youth and also some of the not so positive ways. So how does it actually, from your studies and your findings, how does it affect today's children and youth, Ron? Thank you. So I think there are a couple um, framing issues that have already come up. How do we balance the positive effects and the, and the vulnerabilities. In many ways, what technology and AI in particular is doing is expanding learning opportunities and learning vulnerabilities. And our motivation to engage and, and provide access to young people so they can use these tools in ways that are going to help them learn and be successful is always balanced with the vulnerabilities of how that could actually um, you know, create uh, challenge, new challenges. But those change across development. How that is, how that precarious balance is best managed when uh, young people are ch young children, mid childhood, early adolescence, mid adolescence, late adolescence is continuously changing. Not just a function of age, but as a function of experience and maturity. The goal from a developmental science point of view is how do we inform in a multidisciplinary, team-based approach understanding how to make the positive aspects of these technologies and, and capabilities larger than the vulnerabilities that everyone has been aware of and is worried about. And this is really going to take these um, multi-perspective integrative approaches and they're very different in different contexts and for different ages and stages of development. We know a lot about these developmental processes uh, from many other aspects of studying development. AI is amplifying the, the opportunities and vulner, vulnerabilities in really exciting ways, but also concerning ways. And these kinds of discussions and bringing together people with different kinds of insights are really going to be crucial to try to tip that balance to increase the positive opportunities while diminishing the vulnerabilities. And Ron, if I could just follow up with you as well, what are some of those sort of real life opportunities and some of the things that we need to be worried about why we're having this panel? So I think there are a couple things. And one is to think about windows of development when particular kinds of experiences may really have long-term impact. I, and I think the second thing is that sometimes we, we think about learning as primarily information, but learning is also shaping our social and emotional development, our values, our sense of identity. We're, we're experiencing the world through these technologies. And so really understanding in more specific ways, the kinds of vulnerabilities at different times in development, but also that the, that the edge between opportunity um, and, and risk and vulnerability is often a, a really delicate balance. When we're trying to protect young people, we can actually interfere with the learning. If we promote autonomy and exploration, we can increase the risk. So it's really going to require uh, combining knowledge from different fields to inform how do we develop policies, practices, and engage uh, stakeholders in business to think in a deeper way about using all the knowledge we have to promote positive 
uh, growth and development uh, in young people through these technologies while minimizing the risks. Uh, Virginia, you are the lead author of UNICEF's policy guidance on AI for children that was recently released. We just heard from Ron about this delicate balance and you know, from our other participants, why this is so significant. What are the goals though of this guidance? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, um, the, but the, uh, the, this guidance came from the first from the realization that there is a lot of uh, documents and strategies and principles coming about on how to use AI, how to develop AI in a trustworthy and human-centered way. But a lot of these uh, documents, a lot of these principles and guidance, strate strategic guidance, are not addressing the specific issues of children uh, directly. So with UNICEF and with this guidance, we tried to address exactly the policymakers and the business on how they can uh, address the, the children's rights and the specific uh, needs and requirements for children in their uh, design and development and use of AI across uh, public and private space. So the focus are the foundations for this guidance are three aspects. Uh, protecting children, of course, ensuring that AI is doing no harm to no child. But uh, that's only one of the parts. So that the foundation is to ensure that AI is providing to, for children in a way that children are empowered to uh, build uh, their own uh, development and their own um, uh, future in a way that they are participating in in the way in the in the way AI is being developed and also in the way they are able to use or to uh, profit from AI. Uh, from these three foundations, uh, protection, providing, and participation for children, we uh, propose in this document nine requirements, which are all centered around supporting uh, through AI children's development and well being. And that means that we have to ensure, of course, uh, fairness, non discrimination, uh, privacy, safety, and so on. But also that we, uh, governments and policymakers and business, should be able to create an enabling environment in which all can contribute to this child centered AI uh, uh, proposal. At this moment, the document is open for consultation, so we welcome through the website of UNICEF all comments and suggestions and ideas on the document. It's still uh, for a few more weeks is open, and we really open hope that with this document, uh, governments, private and uh, and the public uh, uh, sector really uh, start taking the child rights central in the way that AI is being used and developed. Absolutely, a lot of collaboration. Um, and what we will get, I see in a comment from the audience, we will get the name of the document. Perhaps, Virginia, you could provide a link so that people can access that. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Minister Senge. For sort of this real life example, what is the government of Sierra Leone doing to address the digital divide? Uh, and what can other developing and middle income countries learn from your experience? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think in terms of the digital divide, one, it's just policy, it's principles. Um, the Directorate of Science, Technology and Innovation launched what we called the um, National Innovation and Digital Strategy. And the strategy is titled Digitization for All. And what that means is um, we have to bring digitization for all. And for you to be able to do that, your guiding principles are guiding principles. One is mobile first and first. And lots of people who connect um, are connecting via mobile. Um, another one is hybrid technology. So online, offline, web, mobile, um, radio, uh, connectivity for all. And then um, country as AI lab, like artificial intelligence lab and parts of the framework there is when we use big data, data science to solve problems, um, you, at a national level, you're able to get better outcomes. So in practice, um, for example, when COVID happened, we use mobile first solutions to build self-check and information provide as um, for, uh, for COVID and symptom check and trackers that was SMS and USSD based that now has about five or five million plus uses in two months or after we 
we launched it from over 200,000 unique users. Um, we are engaging on policy with, with, um, with WEF, um, particularly with, with the drone consortium. And we have a drone um, corridor that we launched uh, with UNICEF and with GIGA, we are looking to have connectivity for all. And more recently, again, through WEF, um, we had a Coursera workforce development that I was at an event today, one of my colleague cabinet ministers came to tell me that he had his all his directors sign up for that. Um, and he himself had signed up for a class. And, and I think it's that we understand that the, the president's vision is human capital development. And you can't deliver human capital development without digitization. And you can't really um, move a few people. You have to move everybody. And so, for example, in my ministry, um, I, I lead as well the Ministry of Education. We have a policy of radical inclusion, which means we have to ensure that everyone everywhere can have access to the same quality of education. Often it means that we have to bring digitization and data and um, hybrid technology solutions. So it's, it really is, it has to be a desire and we're lucky if the president believes in this and the SDI sits in the office of the president and um, I, as Chief Innovation Officer, do have a cabinet portfolio. So uh, we can move things at the highest levels that we need. That's fascinating. Um, a lot of different angles that you, you look at this with the mobile first contact tracing. So, so relevant in this moment we are in right now, six months, uh, at least in the US, six months into the pandemic. Let me get to Alexander next. Uh, we've heard from how the public sector and the nonprofit sector think about the use of um, artificial intelligence but and the digital divide. How can the private sector, though you're in a unique position to address this, how can the private sector work with governments and nonprofits to address the digital divide? How do you think of this? Uh. Thank you very much. This is for us as a for private sector is a really important question. And uh, okay. actually, I think uh, altogether we should learn how to manage all uh, key risks of development of AI technologies. And we have enough of this. Uh, this is, uh, and uh, all those risks, um, especially for children, uh, digital divide and social discrimination, especially in the, uh, uh, for the young people, uh, this is really important loss of control of AI system and possible harm to a child. Uh, that's robotics and so on. Um, incomprehension of AI technologies and the unpredictability. Not enough consistency and security of, of AI decision support systems. And you talked about TikTok, yes? And this is about recommendation system. And this is really important what AI will recommend for my child. And this is uh, more than important. Uh, and uh, actually also AI could be used uh, for bad reasons like manipulating public opinion, uh, fake news, and especially among young people on the social networks. This is, uh, this is really, it could be really dangerous and somehow we, we should understand uh, how we will uh, manage AI. And I think we must on the uh, international level to start discussion about uh, um, uh, ethics, AI principles, so to say. Uh, for us, we see, we, we have this discussion inside of our organization, we are the big bank, we have 300,000 of employees, more than 90 million of clients, uh, retail clients. And uh, so uh, we think about five, uh, uh, five uh, milestones, so to say, five, uh, mm, uh, five principles. AI should be secure, AI should be fair, AI should be responsible, AI should be explainable and reliable. So, and uh, when we have some, mm, uh, uh, so we, we could talk about this and we could have really fruitful discussion about this. And this is- Thank you, Alexander. For, for, for our children. Absolutely, you bring up a lot of really good points. Uh, the ability for artificial intelligence to be used for censorship, for propaganda, how it can, you know, heighten that digital divide. Faiz, let's come to you, back to you. Um, and let's talk about today. A lot of our discussion is talking about what needs to happen, but I'd like to ask you what UNICEF is doing today and how it's using AI to benefit children and youth. And how would you like to collaborate with other sectors in the future? Uh, so 
I will talk a bit, a bit about. Uh, oh, sorry, Alexander, that was a question. We, I, I do want to get your view on this. That was a question for Fayez, if you don't mind, but we'll come back to you after briefly. Okay, great. Great. Uh, thanks, Deirdre. Thanks for that. Uh, UNICEF actively works uh, to identifying opportunities where new technologies and AI can strengthen our programming and positively impact the lives of children. However, it's essential. We do no harm in the process and forever aim at providing equal access. We work closely with a broad range of partners and stakeholders in this space, and we welcome collaboration. I think collaboration is key here. Our approach to AI is both academic and also practical. UNICEF recently partnered with GovLab at New York University to articulate principles on responsible use of data for children. This built on ex existing frameworks using a specific child focus lens to understand the risks and concerns specific to children. This work also created practical tools and support for our field staff, our partners, and governments to guide our own data and data technology investments. Last week, we also launched draft policy guidelines specifically on AI for children. In partnership with the government of Finland, this was a broad consultative process that continues today. We welcome all sectors to implement the guidance but also share the experience and let us know what's working and what's not so that we can go back and we refocus, reprogram and, and, and uh, reform. As the world's leading organization for children, UNICEF recognizes the potential that AI systems have, especially for supporting every child's development. In an effort to map every school in the world, we were leveraging and improving AI algorithms to identify school structures from satellite imagery through machine learning. This is happening in partnership with the private sector. For instance, Ericsson has committed funding and expertise to assist in with the collection, the validation, analysis, monitoring, and visual representation of our real-time school connectivity data. This is a pathway to connectivity and digital learning, which we've heard today. That is foundational for providing opportunities to children, no matter where they are. To ensure better health outcomes, children at UNICEF are applying AI to assist healthcare workers in rural areas with diagnostic decision and support uh, mechanisms for pediatric clients. This diagnosis support also helps forecast risk in complex or rapidly changing situations like we find ourselves in today in epidemic outbreaks. We're also using AI to improve education at student level. Remedial learning platforms for students with disabilities automate school workflow and provide accessible content and academic services to students who will flourish with this additional support. But it's important that equity and of access and AI systems in their development is always there. So UNICEF will continue to help define global standards for and how to engage in artificial intelligence and machine learning to enhance children's lives. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank you very much for that. And let's talk more about equity and access. Sandrine, this next question is for you. What are some of the challenges that women and girls in Rwanda face as they try simply to learn about artificial intelligence? And do you have any ideas on some of the ways that this could perhaps be addressed? And that one's for Sandrine, please. Thank you for your question. Well, um, when you look at the involvement of women in AI technology, uh, there's a big divide between the male and the female with the stigma that, you know, it tends to be tougher for the females. But and this has led to a low rate of, of engagement of women and girls being in, being in the industry and pursuing careers. I, for one, was introduced to AI when I was in grade 10. And um, I, normally I would, see the, I would see students come into the club and then go and then drop it after three days. And this got me triggered and I wondered why. And after some time, I realized that there was, that, that, that regardless of the stigma that sometimes AI can be seen as an impenetrable subject, you know, that for that it that it is that it seems to be difficult the exposure was a bit poorly timed because because 
because they lacked confidence, they thought it was they were, thought it was hard because they had been introduced to it at a later time, at a later date in their lives. So I was thinking if if to get, to imp- to enhance such to enhance their interest, we if technology AI technology was introduced at a younger age to children, then we can nurture we can nurture their interest and demystify. AI technology, you know, make it make them familiar with it so that they grow to be confident and pursue careers in the, in the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrine. And that's a great suggestion earlier, uh, the better for understanding and to bridge that there's that digital divide, but there's also that gender divide. Uh, thanks for your answer there. Virginia, uh, have you seen similar things? And also, which applications of artificial intelligence provide the most promise and the most potential benefit to children and youth users around the world? Thank you, Deidre. Um, just before I answer your question, I would like just to make clear that we are talking about the technology, a tool that has built by us. AI is not a magical entity which can, for all kinds of ways, do things and unexpected or expected. Its technology is built with a purpose and we people set that purpose. So it's very important to understand also that AI is not intelligent in the way that we are intelligent. An AI system doesn't understand in most cases the meaning of what is seeing. It can tell you that something is a cat or a dog or a child or an adult, but it will not have an understanding of what it means to be a child or a cat or a dog. So it's very important to take that into account when we are developing AI technology and when we are using this technology. It's also when we talk about responsible AI and responsibility in AI is not the software itself which should be responsible, but it's of course the whole social uh, social environment and the institutions around it, the ones who develop, who use, who deploy these systems, which are responsible and which are uh, accountable for the trustworthiness of these systems. So when we talk about what type of applications work or don't work, in it, in a sense, because, uh, because of this and because AI is a general uh, purpose technology, it, it's uh, in most cases we can use AI for a positive or for a negative uh, influence on children. So if you take, for instance, uh, AI powered toys, which that are increasingly available around and which we talk about in the report, these toys can provide children with uh, capabilities and um, education, educational support uh, in many different ways, but also we we can see concerns and there are uh, many concerns being raised by the way that these toys deal with the privacy and safety for children. The same with uh, systems for uh, biometric recognition, which can be used in many, uh, and we see many applications in which it can be used for supporting, for instance, identifying children in a a war situation or in a refugee situation, children which have been abducted, we can use this type of technology in a very positive way. But of course, it can also be used in an extremely negative way of which we all know a lot of examples. So it's not so much what technology can do, but what we are doing with the technology and what we should be doing with the technology. That's a great point, Virginia. Thank you uh, for making that clear. It's not a magic bullet and the people behind it uh, shape that technology. So that's that's a whole big discussion also that I'm glad that you touched on. Uh, Ron, how can AI be leveraged in ways to benefit children's youth and educational experiences? So a similar question that Virginia just answered, but how do you view this, especially sitting in a place like Silicon Valley uh, where the future of AI is debated on a daily basis. Thank you. I, I wanna pick up on the theme that Virginia outlined. When we think about learning and, and to recognize that these human dimensions of learning around social experiences and values and motivations are equally as important as cognitive skills. I think if we take too narrow of a goal with education about developing cognitive skills, as much as reading and and math skills are essential. What we know about the human brain is that it, it, it's specialized for social learning and, and be things like meaning and purpose and value and the feeling that an individual matters, that learning is powerful. And if we aren't humble about AI and machine learning with a more narrow purpose, I think we will 
um, we won't do justice to the capabilities. The second thing I would say is that there's an exciting set of collaborations between people who try to understand how children and adolescents actually learn um, and do that with modeling and in the science of learning uh, in, in terms of how, why are children so much better than machine learning systems and AI systems. There's, and, and the collaborations between people who model and, and do computational modeling for driving better AI and machine learning uh, are increasingly collaborating with people who are trying to understand why children are so remarkably good at learning uh, in complex uh, situations. And I think that could lead to a more integrative understanding of learning that could also help bridge this gap between a narrow set of goals uh, driven by potentially commercial interests um, or people rushing forward with being able to in, improve some aspects of learning, but not thinking about the whole child in a social context that is so crucial to the well being of children, not just their cognitive skills. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Alexander, you did outline earlier on in the session Russia's national AI strategy with those six sections that you told us about. But how do you see its deployment? Can you tell us a little bit about this, especially when it comes to AI and youth? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Russia has a national AI strategy, a national AI development strategy, and uh, uh, this strategy identifies key principles of ethical AI, and uh, the strategy sets up ethics principles to protect human rights, including making sure that children are under protection as well. Um, so one of the key challenges of, challenges of the strategy is the development of an accessible and affordable system for education and training of high level AI specialists. Because for our understanding, uh, children should start uh, learn about AI as early as they can. And only after this, they, they will use this technology for, for good. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, uh, we have a national academic competition on AI pre-acceleration of more than 5,000 team of students. Uh, uh, so we distinguish some in the, uh, initiatives aimed to development AI technologies into a separate stream, AI for good. And uh, we have uh, a really strong KSG agenda and uh, we uh, push um, our children to this ESG agenda. For example, this year, uh, it will be a Russian-wide competition um, about uh, how to prevent uh, east, east of Russia from floods, uh, because that's always a problem. And somehow we could uh, predict some floods uh, of river Amur. And uh, children will solve this problem uh, based on AI. Um, also, uh, uh, in history, um, I mean, there's... Uh, uh, AI decoding of manuscripts of uh, Peter the Great. Uh, so children will uh, uh, actually uh, decoding based on AI uh, manuscript of our the biggest tsar. Uh, so, um, uh, so based on AI, we uh, push children to uh, solving uh, problems uh, of the entire society of ecology, of social, and uh, this is our vision uh, based from uh, our national AI strategy. And for sure, we would be happy when uh, in our hackathon, this is AI journey, we'll participate other children from, uh, from, from other countries. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, that's, that's incredible. And an example too, if you give children the tools that they can solve some of the most critical problems. So uh, thank you for bringing that to us. Minister Sange, I wanna ask you what policies is your government thinking of introducing to the children of Sierra Leone to give them the opportunity to succeed in the age of AI? Um, I think before I was, before I joined cabinet, there was a four IR cabinet paper that the uh, Minister of Higher and Technical um, was was pushing. We definitely, um, so at the cabinet level, we're looking at seeing how we can bring 
um, a, for IR um, topics, including AI, then um, at higher technical institutions. The cause is that we make available, then we have scholarships available for any woman who wants to do science, STEM, um, all the way through their yeah, education. Um, and we create a pipeline of opportunities for people who are leaving university to, to, to be entrepreneurs. You know, the, the, the vision for um, BSTI is um, to use science, technology, and innovation to address national development challenges and to make Sierra Leone into one innovation and entrepreneurial hub. So it's also about building an, an ecosystem. In the basic and senior secondary education, we just launched a curriculum framework um, as in one of, one, of my, uh, one of the work that we've done. And there are five Cs that now this next week they are rewriting all of the syllabus in all of basic education, I think 16 subjects to reflect this. One is civics. The other one is critical thinking. Um, computational thinking, so this is where that ties in, computational thinking, comprehension, and critical thinking. A combination of critical thinking and computational thinking, we call them the five Cs, um, are important. And it's all linked to what um, other panelists have been saying, AI for good. You have to be able to understand civics for you to be able to use your computational thinking and critical thinking to problem solve in matters that will transform your country. And you have to be able to comprehend the problem and comprehend the analysis. So the five Cs are all intricately linked to use creativity and design and STEM, STEM, AI, for to problem solve something that will transform your country. And it's a mix of um, several things. Education to higher technical education to skill development and workforce um, reskilling and building ecosystems for that as well. Thank you for that. I, lo I love these real life examples that puts a lot of the issues we talk about into practice. Sandrine, I'd like to end with you, conclude with you because um, I know we started out this panel and you said something really interesting. You said that youth may be worried about the effects. You were optimistic um, after this discussion, after hearing from both the public and the private and the nonprofit sector, how do you feel? Are you hopeful? Do you think that AI can be used for good to empower children and youth around the world? Thank you for your question. Thank you for giving me this platform. From what I've heard, AI for good. Your the mission is using is using is promoting AI technology as well as keeping in mind the risks that AI might bring. I thank you so much for your consideration of the youth right now, giving me this platform to be to be able to talk before distinguished individuals like yourselves. It only it only motivates me and helps me to engage in the in the field even more. I want to. I want to thank the people who are breaking the mold and going beyond beyond that to realize all these AI imaginations that are being put into play at the moment. And I feel motivated as well as the information that I've learned here that I'm going to share with my colleagues as well as the whole as well as the whole as well as the whole peers that I'm going to impact. I thank you very much. And I I can only conclude by saying what AI has always asked us to do, to keep believing. Thank you. That's a that's a great note to end on, Sandrine. Thank you very much. I also feel uh, motivated and optimistic, uh, given the discussions, and also you know we really underlines how high the stakes are right now. Um, I enjoyed seeing many of your faces there, nodding along and participating in terms of questions and comments in the Zoom chat. So please hold on to those. We're going to be going into our breakout sessions, and we'll come back here. Right now, though, I want to introduce. Kay Firth Butterfield. She is head of AI ML at the World Economic Forum, uh, who had a huge hand in bringing all of this together. And I could also see her nodding along too. Okay, let me hand it over to you before we get to the breakouts. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our panelists and all of you for joining us. This is, for me, the most consequential of the, um, of the projects that we're actually doing. And um, that's because it's trite to say, but children really are our future. And getting it right for children is just so important. I started my life as a human rights lawyer concentrating on the rights of children. So this is so near and dear to my heart. 
And my passion in AI is that we will solve the foundational problems that we have at the moment and um, really be able to use AI for good. So that's really where Generation AI comes in to solve those foundational problems that you've heard some people talking about on the panel so that we can really use AI to benefit youth. Um, the Generation AI project is of course a multi-stakeholder project um, working with PwC. Seth Ferguson actually um, runs this project and he's our fellow from PwC. But we've always used work with UNICEF right from the start, Lego, Dell Technologies, Berkeley, MIT, and many others. So um, please check out the project in the chat with through using the link that has just come into the chat. Um, we have about 120 people working on the project and we would love to have more. So if this is your passion, please reach out, reach out to Seth or me. So as you can see, the goal is developing corporate governance guidelines for responsibly using AI to educate and, and empower youth and children, but also protect them from the, those risks. And we've got these three strategic values, educate, how can we educate and benefit children and youth to meet SDG 4, quality education? Again, we need to put the foundation in first. Empower, how can we empower and inspire diverse users and the next generation of leaders to use AI? And of course, that protecting, we have to put in the protections first. So how can we protect and promote children's rights? And we have these three fundamental initiatives under those. First, the AI Youth Council. We want this to be a truly global council and we are just putting it together. Sandrine is one of our Youth Council members from uh, Rwanda, but we also have a Youth Council member from Turkey. And at the moment, we're looking for more. We want to get about 30 young people to begin with, and we want one person from each country. So if you know a youth in the 13 to 21 age bracket who's interested in AI and passionate about digital, let us know. Um, the other um, big initiative is the Smart Toy Awards. This is in partnership with uh, Will I Am, and to begin with, we are going to look at the under sevens. You heard Ron talk about you know, different levels of use of AI and children. The under sevens are a particularly, uh, a particularly challenged uh, group because frankly, they don't have the development of their brains to be able to know what's real and what's fake. And um, the possibilities around the problems around security for that group of children, how you continue getting creative play when they're interacting with toys that come already preloaded with backstories, you and I made them up, how we think about their privacy and many other issues, for example, use of facial recognition in those toys. And you might say, well, that's a rather third first world, um, first world problem. And how are we thinking about this? Well, what we say is if we can build the foundations for proper use of AI with children, looking at these smart toys, then we can make sure that we have built the right foundations to use AI for education for everybody, which is really what most of us are here and um, as a main goal for our work. And then of course, we have the thought leadership. With the Smart Toy Awards, and we contributed, for example, to the UNESCO, UNICEF um, paper that uh, Virginia was talking about. When we think about the Smart Toy Awards, we will launch the awards formally in January, and we will be giving the prizes with Will as head of our judges um, panel 
in, um, in April. And so please look out for that project. It is truly foundational and important. Um, so moving to the next slide, we are going to go into our breakout discussions. They're going to be about 20 minutes in length. We will be having a facilitator and a speaker in most of those groups, but we have so many people here today, thank you very much, that um, some of the groups will also be hosted by members of the forum. Um, so I will be facilitating um, the discussion in my group. Uh, please turn on your cameras so that you can have a truly interactive experience and keep your remarks brief because we might be fairly large numbers in our groups and we really want to hear from all of you. So the question that we're going to ask is, how can we collaborate and leverage AI to educate and empower children and youth around the world? And I would probably add, and how do we mitigate those risks that we have to work on first? <laughs> 